Well, we are going to continue talking a little bit about end days, not, not the particulars. I told the particulars, you, you, you read the book of Revelation and, and you'll probably have at least three opinions, just if you read it yourself, right? How many, how many times have you changed your opinion about the book of Revelation over the years? Probably means you still don't have it down. Uh, but, you know, if you want to see the timing, it's real, you know, real simple. We got seven years, you know, seven years of tribulation. It's, it's irrefutable. And the man of lawlessness shows up in the halfway point. So um, I have never been this spiritually excited in, in 27 years because I just see some things happening now, like, you know, Jerusalem. The embassy is going to move to Jerusalem, which is long overdue. Um, <laughs> It was said in the Washington Post that, um, you see, I don't look at things geopolitically. I don't look at things economically. I could care less. I want the Yeshua to come back. You understand? If you ask me, do you want the economy to grow? You want Yeshua to come back? That'd be like asking me, do you want to win the lottery or do you want me to run you over with a vehicle? <laughs> and I'm not, ex I'm not in using hyperbole. Do you understand? And I don't understand how any true blood-bought believer isn't, doesn't want, like, what are you thinking? What, what, where do you live? What do you, what's wrong with you? I don't get what, I just don't get how you think. I, I mean, are you born again? How do you not want the king to take it, you know? <laughs> so when I see these things like, you know, going on, um, these are fighting words. Don't you understand the world hates Israel? And if we p do these things, you know how much they're going to hate us? And I'm so happy. I can't wait for the nations to surround us. I can't wait for the rumblings of war because you have to have a false, false peace treaty. If there's no declaration of war, you can't have a peace treaty. If the peace treaty isn't signed, you're not going to start the tribulation. If the tribulation doesn't start, the man of lawlessness won't come. If the man of lawlessness doesn't come, the man of lawfulness won't come, and the millennium won't start. So what are you thinking? What are you, what are you Lot's wife? Well, you know, we got weddings planned, so I'm not ready for that. What are you thinking? Like, who, whose team are you on? You don't cry out daily for the Lord to return? I don't get it, guys. I don't get it. Still talking about political issues? Really? So now you're a politician. Really? That's what you're upset about? God holds the hearts of kings in his hand, and he guides them like streams of water. He used Nebuchadnezzar. He used Cyrus. What's wrong with you? All I know is what the Lord told me. And he shall come back with the sound of a trump. Look, there's a lot of people that have gone through some tough stuff over the last, I'd say, six weeks. Shirley Long lost her son. Gwen Davis lost her son. Kathy Gobble lost her father. Roy Smith lost his wife. Uh, Mary Beth Milby lost her mom. Diane Hathaway lost her mom yesterday. Stan Thiessen lost his dad. And um, I went to visit Lynn Spencer. I don't know if you know who she is. Uh, they're, they're new to us, uh, her and her husband, but uh, what a horrible situation. Surgery went good, the aftercare. Just killed her. So she's in hospice on Peak Road. So just keep these people in, in your prayers. I have never, ever heard of somebody dying that didn't make me sad, and I don't even have to know them. And I'm not talking about somebody's father at... Beth Yeshua, I'm talking about any time I pass a funeral parlor, any time I pass a funeral parlor and there's cars there, I get sad. Do you get sad? Again, are you a blood-bought believer? If you're a blood-bought believer, there's a couple of things that should be happening. One, you should not be totally happy in this world. If you're a pilgrim in this world and you are totally happy in this world, something's radically wrong with you. And I say radically wrong. You should have a heavenly homesickness that you should carry around all the time. 
doesn't mean you don't have joy. I laugh with my kids. I have fun. I'm, I'm smiling right now. I'm having a great time. But there's a part of me that's like, Greg, you'll never be happy until he comes or you go. And that's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. Also, death was never in the plan. Death is not part of God. God is all about life. So death isn't part of him. It's part of the enemy's plan. So anytime I hear about death, of course I'm born again, I get sad. Does this jive? Come on now. Come on. Nobody's perfect, but come on. We all fall short of the glory, but come on. You can't serve two gods, man. You try. Go ahead. See how happy you are. Tell me about your peace. All right, so we talked about, we got 97 verses of Scripture in Matthew 24, 25. That's when Yeshua talked about the end days. And they basically asked him a question. We've gone over it for two weeks now. The question is, when are you going to come? Or when are you going to come? So he gave them some warning signs and so on and so forth. But he definitely said to them, he stressed, just like in the days of Noah. And that was our Torah Pasha. That's what kicked the whole thing off. Now, in the days of Noah, there was corruption, total corruption. He said, though, in the end days, it will be like in the days of Noah. Where people will be eating and drinking and marrying, but people will be clueless. I'm telling you, tis the season of cluelessness. Just go to any higher educational facility, okay? I think they should all come under an umbrella. See you, clueless university. I mean, give these kids a shovel. What are they going to do with it? What do you do with this? I'm not going to work. People are clueless. The problem is Yeshua was talking to the body of believers and he said, they will be clueless before I come. I don't mind the world being the world. I've never fought the world. I don't know what everybody's so upset. Why are believers so upset with the world? It's the world by definition. Do you ever see Yeshua get on the world? It's the world. You have to have contrast. You gotta have the devil, otherwise you wouldn't have any choice. If you didn't have any choice, you wouldn't be choosing love. You'd be forced. So we need it. I've never been upset about the world. I was once very much in the world. That was the choice I made. Now I make this choice. But you can't be double-minded. And many believers today, I'm telling you, they're just like the world. Eating and drinking and marrying and making plans. And My father had a miserable job. He, sadly enough, he was uneducated. He had a miserable job. He loaded trucks all day long. That's what his job was. And he couldn't wait to, er- to retire. So he got a chance to retire early. And he clicked his heels. And a week later, he dropped dead. He had all these plans. He's going to go downtown, and you know he liked the stock market. He had no money to invest, but he used to, you know, he'd love to go down there. He'd love to go to a ball game. You could sit back then. You could sit in the bleachers at Yankee Stadium. You ready? How much? Dollar. One dollar. Sit in the bleachers. And if your mom was my mom, she could stuff six peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in your dungarees, and nobody knew. Because there's no way you're going to pay another buck for a hot dog. (laughs) Not in my house. Son, I'd rather let you go to jail for bringing in contraband than paying a buck for a hot dog. (laughs) So he had all these plans. And the message it sent to me as a secular person was, screw tomorrow. I'm living for today. And I did. I did. I lived in the fast lane, and I lived a very, very, very wild, crazy life. My mother used to say, you're crazy, son. You're just crazy. I wasn't malicious. I wasn't that kind of crazy. I had friends that were, they were rough. The Bronx was rough. You know those mafia movies you watch? That was my block. And so, you know, kids that are raised by, like, capos in the mob, they're usually not, yes, ma'am, and yes, sir. So it was crazy. It was crazy. But I just... I just thought, hey, you know, my dad had all these plans. He dropped dead, so time's not on anybody's side, so I'm going to go for it. Now I still feel that way, but now I occupy till he comes. I'm doing things for the Lord. It's no time to sit around. 
I don't know. I mean, there's a, there's a time to relax, I'm sure, but I think we're relaxing too much. I need me time. Like, every day? Can you imagine the disciples saying that to Yeshua? Come on, let's go to Samaria and talk to these people. I need some downtime. I'm going to do some yoga and have a latte, Yeshua. <laughs> Maybe tomorrow. So after he said about the cluelessness and the fact that there will be tolerance and we'll fall into theories like relativism and we'll be very apathetic, you know, we played the flute for you, didn't dance. You know, we played, we played a dirge for you, you didn't cry, like we can't get you excited about nothing. You're just like, whatever. And then he said people become incredibly politically correct. Then he gave three warnings, and we're going to go over two because we don't have time to do the third, and then the third's really important because it has a lot to do with Israel, and I want to get into that in a whole session next week, okay? Sound all right? So we get into Matthew 25, which he didn't stop at Matthew 24 and go, okay, this ends the chapter, disciples. We'll take a break. We'll come back tomorrow, and I'll start with chapter 25. He, he spoke the whole way through. Bible scholars and Bible teachers broke it up for teaching purposes. There's no malice, no malfeasance. So you got three warnings regarding the end of the age. You got the parable of the ten bridesmaids. You got the parable of the servants or the parable of the talents, depending on which version you read, same thing. And then you got the parable of the final judgment. So you've got basically the foolish bridesmaids, you got the foolish servants, and you got the foolish nations. Okay, so we'll go over the first one. Let's read Matthew 25, 1 through 10, and then we'll break it down like we usually do. Expose. We'll expose. We'll be expository. We'll expose. Expose. I need a robe. It sounds so much better. When you wear a robe and you say that, it sounds so official. Stop laughing. The kingdom of heaven at that time will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went out to meet the groom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were sensible. The foolish ones took lamps with them, but no earl. Whereas the others took flasks of oil with their lamps. Now the bridegroom was late, so they all went to sleep. I mean, this is unbelievable. It's just unbelievable. He's just so unbelievable. He tells them they're going to be clueless, and then he, and then he throws this at them. The next verse. Just perfect. Now the bridegroom was late, so they all went to sleep. It was the middle of the night when the cry rang out, The bridegroom is here! Go out to meet him! The girls all woke up and prepared their lamps for lighting. The foolish ones said to the sensible ones, Give us some of your oil, because our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both you and us. Go to the oil dealers and buy some for yourselves. But as they were going off to buy, the bridegroom came. Those who were ready went with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Yikes. All right, let's look at the very first verse. It says, the kingdom of heaven, and I italicized at that time, because we have to know the time. So what, what time is it? What, 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 he's, he's giving us an earthly story with a heavenly message. That's what a parable is, a parabola. He's giving a story that we can relate to, but the message is from heaven. And he's saying at that time. At that time means it places this parable directly preceding and during the Messiah's return, right before he's ready to come. Okay? So he's giving this parable, and he's going to use this as an illustration, something symbolic about what's going to happen right when he comes and as he comes. Okay? You got it? His return. Yes? Are you with me? Clear. <laughs> Clear. <laughs> okay, let's look at the word lamp because it's very telling. Lampas in the Greek. A torch where the flame is fed with oil. Really? Yes, but we'll, you'll see. Don't, don't jump the conclusions. Give me a chance. Let's continue. Matthew 25, 2 through 5. Five of them were foolish, five of them were sensible, or wise, depending on what version you read, it means the same thing. The foolish ones took lamps with them, but no oil, whereas the others took flasks of oil 
with their lamps. Now, the bridegroom was late, so they all went to sleep. Okay. There were 12 bridesmaids. Some of your versions, if you read some of the older versions, it says what? What's the word they use? Virgins. Obviously, a bridesmaid is not one who attends the bride. It's a bride. Okay? It's a bride. And obviously, the bride should be a virgin, no? I mean, <laughs> that's... That's the idea, okay? That's, that's, that's the opportune idea. All right, so here they were. So it, what, I'm, what I'm getting at, guys, or what I think I'm getting at is it wasn't like five virgins and five harlots. They were all virgins. So, so far, nothing differentiates them, right? And they all had lamps, right? So nothing differentiates. And they all went to sleep. It's not like the five you know, wise virgins stayed up vigilant so what differentiates them let me show you because the word lamp has an inherent meaning or a root meaning let's take a look lampo it means to shine now this is very telling isn't it no it isn't yes it is no it isn't let me help you anybody need a little help all right the lamp speaks of profession Yeshua is Lord. Easy. The oil speaks of the Holy Spirit. How can you shine your light with no oil in your lamp? The wise ones, they were shining. You know the Matthew 5 thing, shine your light before men. It sounds good, but if you got no oil in your lamp, you could talk all day long. You ain't got no anointing. All the loss is hearing is wah, 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 wah. Because there's no anointing. Even if you know the scriptures. I've heard it. I've sat with them. I've sat with people where they tried to share. And the Lord's saying, I ain't in this at all. And the waiter's going, oh, God. Let me just smile so maybe they'll give me a decent tip. You follow? What happens in Acts 2? There was flames of fire. Why were there flames of fire? Because there was oil poured in their lamps. And you might have had like crazy oil last week, but what about today? Oh, Rabbi, you don't understand. In high school, I was cool. Great. That was like 30 years ago. That's what differentiated them. Five had the oil and five didn't. Now, let's continue on. Matthew 25, 6 through 9. It was the middle of the night. You know, you always got to be ready. It doesn't mean you've got to be up. They were sleeping. But they still had oil in their lamp. You follow? They were ready. They were tight with the Lord. It was the middle of the night when the cry rang out. The bridegroom was here. Now, do you know about Jewish weddings, Orthodox weddings? There's a patrol, a nesuim. There's a, there's a process, an erosine. There's a patrol. There's a consummation. First is a courting process. Once the courting is official, the father sends his son with a flask of wine, and he says, go get your bride. He goes before his bride, or his future bride, anyway, and he gets on one knee, and he drinks from the wine. He says, I love you, and I'd give you my life. And he hands it to her. She was under no obligation to drink from it, but once she did, once she did, they were betrothed. You follow? He was probably courting her for a while. It's not like they didn't know each other, and he said, she looks good. I think I'll, Dad, can I get some wine? It, you know, they were courting. They're going through that phase. And now the patrol is happening, okay? She didn't have to drink it. It wasn't arranged. But if she did, what does that sound like? Communion, guys. That's why nobody in the church really understands communion. There's the blood and body. They're not, it's not that so much as when they're drinking it, they're saying to Yeshua, and I love you, and I get, I'm marrying you. You follow? I'm marrying you. We're, ma we're married now. We're betrothed. Now, in Judaism, the betrothal, you're as good as married. You play the harlot. That's not good. And what does, the groom, what, does the, what does the groom do after they drink? They have a little party, but he splits. And where does he go? To his father's house, not his house. To his father's house. And what does he do? He builds an extension, a room for them to consummate the marriage. Well, if that don't sound like Yeshua, Rabbi, what are you telling me? That's what he did, right? He came, he handed us the cup in his blood, we drank from it, so now we're betrothed. He left and he went to his father's house, in my father's house in many rooms. Rabbi, how come it's so Jewish? Knucklehead. The whole thing is Jewish. 
The whole thing. The feast. His, his, he's king of the Jews, king of Israel. You're grafted into Israel. Just because everybody changed it for 1,900 years doesn't mean that the change is of God. If you tell a lie for a long enough time, it becomes the truth. Not to me it doesn't. It's still a lie. It's just been really told for a long time. It's a really good lie. Yikes. Crazy. I mean, to, listen, his parents were Jewish. It's not like he was Catholic. These denominations came after the fact. They weren't instituted by God, not one of them. I don't care what, not Seventh-day Adventists, not the Baptists, not the Methodists, not, not none of them. Not the Pentecostal movement. Nothing. It's the way, and he is the way. So the bridegroom, when the bridegroom shows up, you don't know. The father, he doesn't know when he's going to come back. Does that sound familiar? They ask Yeshua, when are you coming? What did he say? I don't know. Does it not say that in Matthew 24? The hour and the day, nobody knows, not even the sun. Come on, it said, we just went over this for three weeks. He said, I don't know, only the father knows. So when the guy engages the girl and he's betrothed, he leaves. He doesn't know when he's going to come back until the father tells him. Hello? And he comes, listen, how does he come back? His best man blows his shofar to let the bride know, your, your bridegroom's here. What does it say? He'll come back with the sound of a trump. Not a trumpet. It's not going to be Al Hurt or Herb Albert with the T.O. on a brass. It's going to be the father blowing the shofar. A trump, not a trumpet. And then he comes back, and if he hears that, you know, his, his bridesmaid was, was playing the part of a fool, marriage might be off. Is this all right? So the, they yell, the we hear the trumpet, he's back. The bridegroom is here. Let's go out to meet him. And all ten rise. They're all excited. They all made the profession. They all said, I do. Right? We're betrothed. We're betrothed. It's not like, it's not, he's not talking to the world. He's talking to us. We all said, yes, we're in, right? So they all got up. The girls woke up. It wasn't like the five, the foolish ones were like, eh. They were pumped. So they got their lamps and they prepared for lightings. But all of a sudden, the foolish one's like, I ain't got no oil. Now, why didn't they have any oil? Why didn't they have any oil? Well, I think the foolish ones were engaged with many things. All the stars out tonight. I don't know if it's shiny or bright, but I only have eyes for you, <laughs> dear. Moons up above, I see millions of people in love, but they all disappear from view, and I only have eyes for you. Get it? The wise ones, they, they, they were caught up with Yeshua. So he just kept, they were connected. They were connected with Yeshua. Yeshua is connected with the Father. All the oil comes from the source. So it just kept on flowing through Yeshua into their lamps. And what did they do with it? They didn't give it back to Yeshua. He don't need it back. They tried to connect with other people and give it to them. You don't have to give God back the oil. He has a never-ending source. It's like, well, we're giving you 10%. You're not giving him nothing. You're only giving him back what's his. And I'll take Father God over Uncle Sam because Father God asked for 10%. Uncle Sam's asking me for 33. And frankly, I don't even have an Uncle Sam. I don't know where he gets off calling me his nephew. He takes a third of my pay and I never get to see him. He never sends me nothing for my birthday. He didn't show up at my bar mitzvah. Who is Uncle Sam? Some freak. The IRS is like, well, if we call him an uncle, we'll be able to rip him off. 
then they'll think it's okay. Everybody's got a crazy uncle. That's mine. Hopefully that will change. The foolish one said to the sensible ones, give us some oil. Well, of course, they panicked. There's no light. And he's here. It's over. He's here. He's going to take them by the hand and bring them in to consummate the wedding. It's not like they can go, hey, you got an hour? Yet? No. You've got to be ready right now. You can't say, well, I'll, I'll get my stuff. You know, when I get this and I get this, you know, my cousin's going to give me his books and then I'm going to supply some grants. Dude, you're 28. You haven't even started college. Like, I'm not saying it's too late, but come on. He who hesitates is lost. We got to be ready right now. And I got news for you, pal. Some of you think you are ready. And that's the sad news. You were ready at one time. But then you got caught up in everything. You can't get the oil from nobody but the source. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I never shop. I just don't like to shop. The only thing I like to shop is food shopping. That's like my little thing. I don't know what it is. I just, right? I, I love it. In fact, when we were first dating, remember I took you on a couple of dates to shop, right? Yeah. Was that not impressive? Remember on, in, in Yonkers? Right outside the city on Tucker Road? Was, and how often did we spend? We had good times there. Don't knock it. I mean, you wanted to go away on vacation, to go to restaurants. I was like, you're missing it, sweet pea. Come to ShopRite. But what I did this week is I went to Walmart, and I went to Kmart, and I went to Target. And I asked the manager if they had oil. And he said, what kind of oil? I said, oil from the Holy Spirit. And he said, no, they don't carry it. And I checked with Craigslist and eBay, and I never bought anything on their Amazon, and they don't have it either. So if you don't have it, you're not going to be able to get it anywhere but from him. All right, last verse. Matthew 25, 10, he says, but as they were going off to buy, see, the bridegroom came, those who were ready went with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. No second chance when he comes. This is scary. No, this isn't scary. This is, I know some people like, Rabbi, I grew up with fire and brimstone. What's wrong with that? When he comes, there's going to be fire and brimstone. I mean, people are like, don't, don't talk like that anymore. You've got to be motivational and encouraging and tell us we're all doing well. So when he comes and we don't have the oil and the door is shut, we'll feel great. What's wrong with you? The word of God, energized by the Holy Spirit, is sharper than any double-edged sword. I mean, when you go see a surgeon, do you tell him, oh, don't use a sharp scalpel. Can you just kind of massage it? Do you really have to cut that? I mean, he cuts, he sews, he splits, and then you're like, oh, I need pain med! Well, the healing process takes a long time. That's God's department. They can't heal. They can only start the process. God heals. The body's self-healing. You get a viral infection, do nothing. 10 to 12 days, you're going to heal. Who did that? Yes, remember, there's one God. I love medicine, and I love doctors. My best friends are doctors in Florida, and I have some best friends here, and I love doctors. But remember, yes, MD, me doctor, not me G. As they were going off to buy, the bridegroom came, and the door was shut. See, this is what my take on it. They love the Lord just enough to totally... To not totally love the world. But they love the world just enough not to totally love God either. It's, it's this game that we play. How much, we don't even know we're playing the game. That's the beauty of it because it's Satan's game. How much of the world can we hold on to? And how much of God can we hold on to where when he comes I'll still get in? I, you, know, you know these kids in school? I just want to pass. You're a moron. That's all you want to do. 
I just want a job. This is a, I just want a job where I'm paid the maximum for doing the minimum. I got a great job. I do nothing. They pay me $18 an hour. First of all, who's paying $18 an hour to do nothing? I'll take that job. The government. I'm only kidding. <laughs> That's who. <laughs> you know it, some of you. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. Of course, it's true. The truth hurts. It's a slap of truth right there. But that's the problem. We, we, we kind of fall in love with the Lord, but we, you know, Lot's wife, we just don't want to give it up. It does not mean that you have to be austere. I tried that. You ask Bernadette how many CDs I've broken that have come in the house. Ask her how many times I just cast out this and cast out that, how many times I walked into a, an elevator and Frank Sinatra was singing Fly Me to the Moon and I cursed it and walked out. That's a little nuts, okay? Okay, nuts is not one of the fruits of the Spirit. Okay, that's spiritually spooky. By the same token, be vigilant. Be vigilant. When your kids are watching shows and you want to know why it's seven years old, they're talking about boyfriends and being promiscuous, that's your fault, not theirs. That's your fault. They're not wise enough or strong enough to guard their gates. But by the same token, when you force them like a maniac, they'll probably rebel. Sadly enough. Rabbi, it's hard. You better believe it is. Parenting is not for sissies, and following Yeshua is not for weaklings. It is intense. But pray. Ask the Lord. Don't develop your own system. Don't walk in your own wisdom. Ask the Lord. He'll tell you. I promise. If you ask, he'll answer. If you seek, you'll find. If you knock, he'll open the doors. He will. Why? Because he's a good, good father. He wants to help you. You just got to want the help. I mean, if we get married, we have kids, and we think we're a good parent. Like, I know, you know nothing about, what do you know about parenting? Well, I, I read a book. You got it. You got it. Overall, this, 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 this part, this parable is real simple. The message is so simple. Be a wise bridesmaid. Okay? Okay? Be a wise bridesmaid. Make sure your lamp is, has oil. What, what does that mean? It means it's about connection, not about perfection. We try so hard in the church world to look perfect, to act perfect. We put all the bows in our kid's hair. We make sure that our kid has the spray and they look perfect. And the whole house is shot. The house is shot. They fought the whole way over here. But you spend all that time doing that as opposed to praying with the kids and trying to seek the Lord's face. But it's a reflection on me. If my kid doesn't look perfect, it's a reflection on me. Look, everybody knows your kid's not perfect. It's obvious. I don't know who you think you're kidding. If we're not perfect, how do you get off trying to make them perfect? And you'll drive yourself crazy. I'm a recovering perfectionist. No, I've never met anybody like me, a lunatic. But I'm done. My kids, had, they had to learn how to dress themselves. Really, I mean, by the time they were three, they would dress themselves because I was done. I'm not going to pull out their clothes. And they'll dress the way they want. They want to dress down. They want to dress up. It's their call. And if you want to judge them by the way they're dressed, I have no problem with it. I just don't want to stand next to you when you start judging them. You've got to let them make decisions, guys. Because if you make all the decisions for them, pal, when they're 18, they're going to decide for themselves and guess what decisions they're going to make. Totally opposite to subconsciously just get back at you for all the time you put them under your thumb. Don't exasperate your children, the Bible says. You're a father, not a warden. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. We don't know what we're doing. I don't know what I'm doing. You ask, well, Rabbi, do you not a parent? No. No, I don't. 
No, I don't. I look at Yeshua's character and think if he was a father, what kind of father would he be? I try to emulate that, and when I have no clue what to do, I seek the Lord. Father, I don't know what to do. And when all else fails, I just slap them. Just, just slap them. <laughs> and if they say, what's that for? I'm sorry, I didn't hear from the Lord. I just, I didn't know what to do, so I thought a good slap. The other thing I could tell you, the only thing I know that's good about parenting is be real with them. No facades. They, if you think, if you think the world hates the church because of hypocrisy, I got news for you. Your kids are going to hate you a lot more for hypocrisy. Stop being perfect. It's a connection. Connect with the Lord. Connect with the kids. Connect, 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 connect. It's about relationship. It's about being relational. It's about intimacy as opposed to competency. How competent do you think you are? We see in part. I feel so incompetent. I feel so incredibly incompetent. There's no way. I mean, how do you feel so competent? And the longer I minister, the more incompetent I feel. But the longer I minister, the more competent I am in him. I understand he's competent. He's God. I thought, you know what I'm talking about? You know in martial arts when the kid bets the yellow belt and he thinks he's Bruce Lee? And it's only until he gets about a fifth degree black belt that he realizes what the deal is. Anybody know what I'm talking about? When you knew it's something, you think you got it all figured out, right? Nobody can tell you anything. You know, you were a teenager once, right? But then the longer you spend time with the Lord, the longer you realize, Father, and you don't have to beat yourself up. You just got to go, I don't know what I'm doing. Who knows? Who knows? Why does some crack mother have a kid that goes to Harvard, and why does some guy that goes to Harvard has a kid that gets addicted to crack? It's not always your fault. It's, it's kids make, the people make decisions. I make decisions. People make decisions no matter how well you rate, no matter how good you're, it doesn't mean that you blew it. And for the idiots in church who look at you and look down upon you because your kid's struggling, just blow them off. They don't really even care. If they cared, they'd come around and support you, not judge you. Just by judging, they're showing their heart. I have nothing to do with those people. I'm like, please, put away your sword. Don't be taking out your Bible and saying, on God, I'm done with you. There's no love coming from you. I, you already showed yourself to me. I know who you are. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take off the sheep's clothing. Show your fangs. It, it, life is hard. I mean, does anybody realize that? I mean, I was so careful, and then I just said about 10 years ago, you know what, I'm done. I'm going to let them make all their own decisions, so if they mess up, it's on them. <laughs> no blame. <laughs> you do your best, but be honest, be real. Stay intimate with God. Stay intimate with God. Keep the oil flowing. That's your only hope. It's your only hope. You've got to have an anointing not to preach, not to be an evangelist. You've got to have an anointing to be a believer. Kind of anointing to be a believing parent, a believing son, a believing employee. You've got to have that juice flowing. It, it's a power from on high. And last but not least for this, it's, it's about desperation, not obligation. You should never feel obligated. Maybe when you're young because you're not connected yet with the Lord for some reason, you know. You feel obligated. Well, I have to go. This is where, you know, my parents used to go to church, and now they got this knucklehead messianic congregation, and I can't have bacon, and I don't know what happened, and I hate it. <laughs> One day you'll read the Bible for yourself and realize it's in there. See, it's not about obligation. God doesn't want you to be obligated. Well, I have to. I have to. I have to say no to the devil. You should be desperated. Is that a word? It is now. <laughs> you have to have a des like a need, like, God, if I don't, the longing. God, I need you. I want you. Forget about, I want you. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. All right, well, let's move on to the next parable. How's that? We beat the snot out of this one. Let's move on to the next one. Matthew 25, 14, 18, and then we'll go on to the parable of the final judgment next week. For it will be like when he comes. For it, will, it is when he comes. It is when he comes. For it will be like a man about to leave home for a while. All symbolic, you know. Who, who entrusted his possessions to his servants. 
To one he gave five talents, equivalent to a hundred years' wages. Yikes. To another two talents, and to another one talent. To each according to his ability. Then he left. The one who had received five talents immediately, immediately went out, invested it, and earned five more. Another five. Similarly, the one given two earned another two. But the one given one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Let's continue. Now the one who had received one talent came forward and said, I knew you were a hard man, and you harvest where you didn't plant and gather where you didn't sow seed. I was afraid. It sounds, it sounds good, right? I'm just saying. You can't get mad at the guy, right? He's just a little afraid. Not exactly. See, that's what the enemy would want us to believe. But I hope you leave with a different thought. So I went and hid your talent in the ground here. Take what belongs to you. Okay? Let's just break it down real quick. Matthew 25, 14 and 15. For it will be like, when he returns, a man, of course the man is Yeshua, and he leaves home for a while. Guys, I can't stress this enough. Jesus has left the building. Not only did Elvis, he's gone. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? I know this isn't popular because they know he's here. No, he's at the right hand of the Father. I'll, I'll get to my point in a second, hopefully, without you punching me in the mouth. He entrusted his possessions. His possessions, what are we talking about? We're not talking about gold and silver. We're not talking about those kinds of things. Although, there's times that God blesses people because there's certain people who don't have a tight fist. And it's loose, so the money can get in and get out, and get in and get out, and get in and get out. And there's some incredibly philanthropic Christians who have built hospitals and on and on. You can't... We're building a hospital in India. We can't do that without money, you understand? The MJA over the years through incredible benevolent Christian scientists, Zionists have sent $100 million through the Joseph Project to the poor in Israel. $100 million. You can't do that. You can't clothe. You follow what I'm saying? People say, oh, money's terrible. You're out of your mind. It's only terrible if you hoard it. To the one he gave five talents, to another two talents, and to another one talent, to each according to his ability, then he left. So he left. Yeshua's gone. You follow? He's gone. I know that might not be your thinking. I get it. And I'm not going to change your thinking. But it says he left. He's at the right hand of the Father. He has handed over the power to us. You might not realize it, but you're Jesus now. And I've met him in India. I've met him in Israel and Argentina and Nicaragua. You name it. He's all over the place. In, in Luke 24 and Acts 1, he was so emphatic. He said, guys, don't you move. Don't don't even move. Don't go nowhere until you get the gift. It's a gift. The gift of the Holy Spirit. Don't you go nowhere till you get it. What is it? It's the oil. It's the oil. It's the power. It's the way shine your light before all men. You can't shine unless you got the oil. It gives you, and he says, I'm going to give each according to their ability, which means he's not going to ask you, if you don't have the gift of evangelism, he's not going to ask you to go throughout the world and be an evangelist. There's different gifts for different people. He gives according to your ability. God would never ask you to do something that you're not capable of doing. But if you're capable of doing it, he'll give you the power to do it. You follow what I'm saying? But he said, don't leave, don't go anywhere. So this must be an incredible thing because when Yeshua was here on earth, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, correct? Was it given out yet? No, it was always around. In the Old Testament, it was on people. The Spirit had dropped upon King David, but now it's inside. See, when it's on, you can prophesy, but when it's in, you could give it to others. You could pour it out. And could he be... Could he be in the Galilee and Jerusalem at the same time? No. So he was stuck. So he said, you want me to go. You want me to send back to the Father. Because if I go back to the Father and finish my mission, he's going to send this gift to you and anybody who connects with me. 
And now I can have myself all over the place. I can pro- proliferate. Spiritually proliferate. That's, guys, this is incredible. I mean, I get it. I know the songs. You know, I want to be his hands and feet. Listen, I like songs, but stop singing and start doing. I know ministries, they just sing. They just sing. Sing. Let's sing about that guy getting a sandwich. Let's just, God, give him a sandwich. God, give him a sandwich in the Holy Spirit. And let's pray about it. Let's pray about him getting a sandwich. Stop it. It's silly. It's silly. If Samuel sat around singing and praying, nothing would get done. Twenty-five, sixteen through eighteen. The one who had received five talents immediately went. Immediately, when God gives you a gift, or He pours the Spirit in you. Don't go right away. What I'm trying to say is, when God tells you to do something, go. Don't sit around. He opens up a window. Go. Don't go, well, I'll pray about it. You know if God tells you, just do it. He invested, he earned another five. Similarly, the one who had two earned another, but the one who was given one talent dug a hole. Why a hole? Well, it's 2,000 years ago. There was no banks. That's what they did. They put their possessions. I think some of you might be putting your possessions in holes too, huh? <laughs> get to your backyard with a backhoe. We'll get some things done. You preppers, right? I got it on the ground. <laughs> Satan ain't getting mine. <laughs> Nobody's, neither is anybody else, for that matter. The message here, it's not about how much you earn, but how hard you try. It's not about how much you earn. It's not about, well, I led this many, and I did this, and we have the ministry international. It's not about that. Because if you've ever coached kids, you love the scrappy kid. You love the kid who doesn't have the best potential. But he shows up early. He stays late, and he dives for the ball. You love that guy. You know the Rudy type? A coach falls in love with that guy. God is like a coach. Yeshua is like a coach. He's got his players. He just wants you to be a little scrappy. Don't be a prima donna. You know those players who's better than everybody else, and they they think people owe them, right? You know what I mean? It's, It's not about that when it comes to the Lord's economy. Matthew 25, 24 to 25. Now the one who had received one talent came forward and said, I knew you were a hard man. Hold on, time. Does he know, the, does he know Yeshua? He might have made a profession, but he obviously doesn't know you. He doesn't know the Yeshua I know. The Yeshua I know is I'm gentle and humble in heart. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. That does not sound like a harsh taskmaster to me. He didn't know him. Remember what Yeshua says at the end of his sermon? One sermon. One sermon, Matthew 7. Depart from me. I never knew you, because he's saying, you never knew me. You knew the God of your father. You knew the God of your grandfather. Yes, you went to church every Sunday. Yes, you went to synagogue every Sunday. But we didn't have a relationship. You had a relationship with everything and anything else. Is it bad to have a relationship with other things? No, it's great to have a relationship with people. It's great to share. It's great to go out. It's great to bring your family on a vacation. Some of you are going to watch a ball game later or tomorrow. There's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. But when that takes precedence, when you're happier doing that than spending time with the Lord, I think we, we, we have issue. We might have issue. So he didn't really know him. He played it safe. Anybody know about that? Play it safe. I'm going to play it safe. I'm going to set everything up. And, and, and I'm going to play it safe. And then one day, one day, when everything's set up and the kids are gone and I've got my pension, everything's good, I'll go on a mission trip. I'll go to Israel. And then, Rabbi, is it a lot of walking? Yeah, we're not going to fly around to different spots. Yeah. Can I do it, Rabbi? I don't know. Might be too late. Might be too late. He, he, he played it safe. I'm telling you, I'm not telling you to be a, a nut. I got to be careful because, you know, I'm not really totally all there. But I'm saying Zacchaeus went out on a limb, right? That's where we get that saying from. He went out on a limb. It was dangerous. He, he, he took a leap of faith. 
Peter got out of the boat. People make fun of Peter. I can see the disciples going, he fell in the water. You didn't even get out of the boat. Wait, what? If I was Peter, I would have got back in the boat and say, hey, pal, I walked on water for two feet. <laughs> you, you cried in the bow of the boat. Do you know what I'm saying? He got out of the boat. He took a leap of faith. Let me tell you, I don't have this figured out, but, but when I've gone to like India or Kenya, it was bizarre. It was a time that I shouldn't have gone. It was, it was post-op. I was all jacked up. Went over there with C. diff. I mean, that's, you don't go to a country like that. There's n I love you, Samuel, but he'll tell you, there, there's no place more unhygienic than Southeast India. It's crazy. Just crazy. Most people couldn't take the smell. And, and then going to Africa. But I remember going to Africa. And I remember, um, I knew the Lord was in the India thing. And then I just got excited. I wanted to go everywhere. Because I'd already went to South America. I already went to Central America and Europe. I just wanted to start to infiltrate, like India and Africa. So the, the India thing was crazy. It was a God thing. I'm not going to get into it because it's too long of a story. But the Africa thing, I got another email. And I, I, I just, I didn't pray is hard. I just didn't. It was a guy by the name of Vincent Miswari and um, his crew there, and it was in the bush. And uh, I don't even know where it was, because whenever I go, Brenda's like, where are you going to be? And I said, I don't know. She goes, well, how, how are you going to communicate? I go, I won't. She goes, what if they kill you? And then, then like, I hear her go, where's the life insurance policy? <laughs> is, is it in the file box? You all paid up on that? It's painful. Painful. Uh, but, but this is the crazy thing, guys. This is the crazy thing. I went over there, sight unseen. Uh, the moment I got there, uh, 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 we had guns pulled on us. It's very, very corrupt. Um, but I was, I was okay. I don't know what it is. I, I, have a, I have a problem going to the Macon Mall, but I don't have a problem having a gun pulled on me in Kenya. I, don't, I can't. Because I think God, when he sends you somewhere, you know what I mean? You have peace personified. People say, what if, what if, what if, you know, I have to apostatize. What if they ask me, you know, if you don't, I'm going to cut off your head. God will give you the grace. I'm convinced you can't pull that off on your own. Don't worry. If you're connected and the oil's flowing, you won't renounce your faith and you'll have no problem with it because God will give you the power to not renounce it. I believe that. I really believe that. So, God, it's getting hot. So, I, uh, I went over there and the minute I got over there, and then I got over there, something was wrong in my spirit. Something wasn't right about the crew I met. And I felt so embarrassed. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I went with, with the people sent me. It was their funds. I went over there to, to start something and help. And I'm living in a mud hut, and I'm saying, this is, this is not right. And all I could do, all I could do, I thought, I'll come back. I'll still be a blessing to as many as I can. I'll still preach the gospel. And when I come back, I'll tell Beth Yeshua, I'm sorry. I, bl I blew it. I didn't hear right. And if anybody gives me a hard time, I'll be like, where have you gone lately? I was prepared. Do you get it right all the time? At least I tried. You know, all you're doing is, is, all you're doing is, is, is critiquing. You know? There's only a few authors. There's tons of critics. So I was prepared for that onslaught. Um, but... Like a few days before I split to go to Africa, um, I got connected with a guy in Kenya, a guy by the name of Stephen, and his real name is Nyanga, but everybody pronounces it Naganga, but it's Nyanga. And Stephen showed up. I said, look, I'm coming to Africa to meet this guy and his crew. Would you mind coming to, to, to the airport in Nairobi? He said, no, not at all. I'd love to meet you. And then he says, you can even stay with me, and you have nothing to worry about because my house is totally kosher. I'm like, you know, worship's on the seventh day. I mean, he'll kind of dance circles around us when it comes to how he walks out in Messianic Judaism. And the crew that I was with, they didn't want him to come along. And the Holy Spirit said, make sure he comes. And I didn't know why, but that's all I knew. So I said to them, I said, he has to come. And they go, no. And they were very emphatic. And I said, he don't come, I don't come. I'm telling you, I'm getting back. I'm done. 
So, of course, it came, and the whole time I was uncomfortable with me and Stephen were just bonding. I saw the love of Yeshua in him. I mean, I saw a disciple. I just saw a disciple. And then the Lord said, I said, how do I know he's the guy? And he said, I sent you for him. He said, when you get back to his town, watch how his family runs to him. And we got off this train and then got off a bus and showed up in Nakaru and the family. I never see anything like it. I mean, <laughs> I've, never I, I've never met its equal. I mean, they, like he was gone forever. We were gone for like 10 days. And, uh, and then I went to, I went to uh, Nairobi and uh, I went to the biggest slum in the world and I saw kids playing in, in just water full of excrement, 1.2 million people. And what, what freaked me out is that one mile away from the slum, you got these fat cats driving Mercedes in Nairobi. They could care less. And so I said, Lord, I want to do something, but it's, it's overwhelming. Mustard seed, just. So we did. So I just want to show you some pictures because it's crazy. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but these kids are orphans. They have no parents. And they were naked. I mean, they were no clothes. It's not like they had diapers. You can't even afford a diaper. So they had nothing. It's crazy because, you know, most people, what they want from a Jew who believes in Jesus, they just want knowledge. Like, tell us Jewish stuff. And I was like, there's no way I'm sprinkling Jewish stuff all over me. Lord, if that's what you brought me here for, I just, no way. I think we got a few, right? We got a few pictures. That's his one. Look, look at the size of the group now. You know, uniforms and they're, they're graduating. Some of them are going to secondary school. There was no hope. Not, I mean, forget about it. I'm telling you, if you would, if you would see what I would have saw and smelled what I would have smelled. I mean, it was, it was hard. But they have a synagogue. They have a school. They're being fed. They're being taken care of. They have, you know, like surrogate parents. Stephen has a, a whole group of teachers. I mean, what, what, what would cost us a million dollars here would cost 50000 there. So I like to invest in places where it's a good investment. You know what I mean? We don't need a gymnasium so that our kids could come once a week to play basketball for 20 minutes. That's just stupid. They're totally, those are the pastors and those are their wives. Those are the kids in the graduation. That's Stephen. This guy, I'm telling you. Stephen, Samuel, Oni, the Lord bless me with people. You can't, you can't send money. Because if you send money through the post office, the first time we did, the post office, they take it. You've got to send it through different bank accounts. There's all kinds of ways to do it. Because if you send too much, the government gets on you. If they know it comes from a Christian organization, you're out. They shut them down. It's so hard to do, but... These guys, if they get $15,000, the people get $15,000. They live in the same shack they lived when I met them 10 years ago. That's Stephen. I got to get there. I really, really have to get there. They've been, they've been hounding, and not just because they're hounding, I have to go. I'm hoping that after Israel, please pray that everything goes well with me, because after Israel, I just want to do a trip to Africa and India again. I got to get there, because I know from what I saw, even though I see the pictures, I'm going to be blown away. It's nuts. Stephen sharing the word. I didn't want to put that picture in. I think, I think Rox Roxanne, it's on you. I know you're watching. And that's the congregation that we built in Nakaru, celebrating Sukkot <laughs> in the backyard of the congregation of the synagogue. And these guys are thoroughly messianic. Is that it? I think that's it, right? I'm just, what I'm saying, guys, is I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was doing. Oh, have you done that before? Ah, uh, yeah, in, in South America. But I didn't know what I was doing then either. And when I go back there, I don't know what I'm doing. What are you going to do? I don't know. Where are you going to go? I'm not sure. Maybe Tanzania, maybe the Congo. I don't know. We'll just see where the oil is pouring and we'll follow its lead. I'm not sure. 
What's, what's the point when going back? I don't know. God said go back. I don't know. I mean, if you hear different, let me know. Last piece of scripture, Romans 12. These are, these are foundational gifts. They're not The spiritual gifts are in 1 Corinthians 12. It's different. For just as there are many parts that compose one body, and it's not an exhaustive list, you follow? It's just a snippet. But the parts don't all have the same function, so there are many of us. And in union with the Messiah, we comprise one body with each of us belonging to the others. So we all belong. We're all connected. But we have gifts that differ. Our gifts are different. There's no two snowflakes the same. There's no two fingerprints the same. There's no two gifts the same. And which are meant to be used according to the grace that God has given us, according to the ability. If your gift is prophecy, meaning speaking the word of God, use it to the extent of your trust. If it's serving, use it to serve. If you are a teacher, use the gift in teaching. If you are a counselor, use your gift to comfort and exhort. If you are someone who gives this, I'm telling you, you do it simply and generously. If you are in a position of leadership, lead with diligence and zeal. If you're a leader, be zealous. How are you going to get people excited if you're not excited yourself? How can you take them somewhere where you haven't been yourself? If you're one who does acts of mercy, then be merciful with a smile. You follow? Don't try to be something you're not. Don't try to, whatever your gift is, you know, Byrne has a, has a crazy gift of hospitality. It's nuts. You know, she's crying because you're leaving. I'm crying because you're leaving. Get it? <laughs> I wish they'd stay. I'm so happy they're going. <laughs> Everybody has different gifts. We all have different, whatever that is. You don't have to try to be gifted in every arena. It could be small. You might think it's small. Rabbi, I come here on Fridays and I clean the synagogue. That's not small. That's huge. See, that's sometimes huger than what we think the greater gifts are because who wants to clean the toilets? You want a microphone. Whatever the gift is, just use it. No, no gift too small. And don't do, let the Lord tell you what to do. Wait on the Lord. Wait on, he'll tell you, I promise you. If you're willing to say, I don't know. If you're willing to come to him like that, I don't know. I, I promise, why? Okay, if God is good, why would he not tell you if you want to hear? If you're willing to hear and then do, why would he not tell you? Now, there's times I could see in a person what their gift is, whether it's to visit people in the hospital, whether it's to do counseling. I could see it, but I don't want to tell them because I know how people are. They'll think, oh, you have a spot to fill and you're trying to manipulate me. So because I won't do that, this is what I'm asking you. Seek the Lord. And when he tells you, respond immediately. Don't wait around. Occupy till he comes. I'm not, he's not going to drive you crazy. He's not going to pull you away from your family and watch your family fall apart. That's not God. But you don't want to develop something that's not of God because if you ever develop your own ministry and try to walk in it, if you've ever done that, tell me how horrible that is. Horrible. And it's all important. If God says it, it's important no matter what it is. And thank God we got a plethora of people here that minister that legitimately minister to people, whether it's something official under Beth Yeshua's umbrella or it's just people ministering outside to people in the street. The message here is simple too. Don't bury your talents. Don't bury them. As Mother Teresa said, we are not called to be successful. We are called to be faithful. This is not the world. It's not about, well, I led this many. You only led that many. Look at our ministry. It's in that. Look at your ministry. It's piddly. Don't put the world in this. We're not called to be. You know how you'll be successful? If you remain faithful. 
and what the world considers little, if God tells you to do it, it's huge in the heavenlies. Follow? Don't bury your talents. Let God use you. And the more you tell me, Rabbi, I'm just a lay person, the more I'm excited for you. God will always use the weak to shame the strong. He will always use the fool to change the wise. Just when he's using you, and you're the fool, and you're weak, and as he's using you, and as time goes on, don't start going, hey, I'm pretty good at this. Then you become the fool. He'll weaken you. You follow? Stay weak and stay foolish, and don't mess around with God. Don't act like you're foolish when you're not. Don't act like you're weak when you're not. He hates false humility. You're just you. I'm just me. I was like an idiot going to, going to Africa. They thought, oh, we're getting the great rabbi. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I didn't know what I was doing in India. I don't know what I'm doing taking people to Israel. People think, oh, we're going with Rabbi Greg. This is going to be unbelievable. Yeah, okay. If God shows up, it will. I'm not in that position. But you know what? Because if you stay weak and dependent and broken and needy, he'll show up. He shows up here every Saturday. Why? Because we need him. We need him and we pray. My whole prayer time this morning for hours, Lord, I need over and over again. I need you. They need you. We need you. Please, please come. And he wants to be needed. He's like a freak. He wants to be needed. He wants to be the knight in shining armor, but he can only be your knight in shining armor if you'll be the damsel in distress. And if you have it figured out, then he's going to be like, go ahead, have at it. You follow what I'm saying? I know some of you tough guys. I mean, to say you're a damsel in distress, those are fighting words. I'm not asking you to put on a little, you know, little dress and curtsy, but I'm telling you, be a spiritual damsel in distress. Can we handle that? Let's stand together. Next week is going to be the final judgment. Oh, doesn't that sound great? Come and hear the final judgment. Excited. It's going to be a big message about Israel. It's going to be really, can't wait. Yeah, it's going to be really cool. Read about it, read about it, read about it. But I'll give you a hint. When you read about the final judgment in Matthew 25, you're going to see three things. You're going to see sheep nations, you're going to see goat nations, and you're going to see Israel. That's what you're going to see, and we're going to go over it, and I think it's going to be really cool. At least I think it is, and I know he does, so it should be, yeah? All right, be nice to each other. Love each other. We're all in this together. Some of you are coming out of some hard things, but that's because you were in the hard thing. Some of us are going in. You're going to be coming out and going in, coming out and going in the rest of your believing life. Be nice to each other. Don't compete with each other. This is not a place for competition. This is a place to edify and exhort and console. We're all in this thing together, and we're all getting knocked around by the enemy. I get it. Yours truly, you know, it looks good, but there's a lot going on. I'm just saying, let's be a family. Well, I probably shouldn't have said that, especially with my family. Okay, let's be a believing family <laughs> and, and look to support each other, okay? And if, if, if nothing else, when you're out there in the world, just try to remain loving. You know, I know that's not always easy. Be attracted to good hearts and try to change bad ones, okay? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his very countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. Yevarecha v'yishmarecha Yo'eranoi panovelecha v'hunecha Yesadonoi Ponove lecha, viasem lecha, shalom. I love you guys, Shabbat shalom. <laughs>